Hello and welcome to LHS Shop Talk. <laughs> I hit my stuff here. <laughs> LHS Disaster Number Three. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Shop Talk. We're in the shop again. I have I have a little heater down here. It's a little ceramic heater now. It's not really doing squat, but it's better than <laughs> better than the twenty or whatever degrees it is right now outside. I believe my lighter will still work. Right so let's see. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. You're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have uh, I have my Alaskan bear cutter. Nice. These work really well. I mean, it looks like it's just a simple, you know, cheap guillotine, but these are, these are really nice. And I have what, a tube, but I forgot what I put in it. <laughs> it's not, it's not <laughs> what this is. <laughs> Uh, I smoked this cigar a long time ago, but I usually take uh, I take the, the canister and I just grab a cigar, stick it in here, so I can you know take it with me and it doesn't get bent or destroyed or whatever. So yeah, I've had that where you had it in your pocket and uh, you forgot you had it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I grabbed a Milano. Oh, an Oliva. Yep. Yeah. Oliva Siri V Melanio. <laughs> Wait, is this the ones you like or not like? These are the ones I do like. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you had one not too long ago that was not one you liked. Well, it was an okay cigar. It was just a, like a Lancero or a, not a Lancero. What's the other long, thin one? Not a, not a Churchill. Lonsdale? Lonsdale. I think it was a Lonsdale. And uh, <clears throat> it didn't burn for crap, so... <laughs> <laughs> That can happen. Yeah. Long, thin cigars have, have been the bane of my existence. So. All right, so cut this up here. Ah, not a bad cut. Oh, nice open draw. I love that. That's my favorite. <laughs> All right, we'll light her up. So what do you got? So I have, uh, I have two, but I'm only going to smoke one. I got the. Uh, I was talking about this in the chat room the other day. The uh, the big game cigar sampler that uh, uh, Corona Cigar was offering. It's five of each with uh, um, five Rocky Patel Vintage tw 2003 Robustos. Uh, those are five and a half by fifties, and it also had the uh, five HP Upman Banker annuities, and these are six by fifty two. That's this guy right here. And I think I'll do the banker. I, I actually uh, was doing some yard clearing this morning, or driveway clearing this morning, trying to get the, some of the scud off the driveway, getting ready for the next blast tomorrow, and, and already smoked one of these Rocky Mattels. So, so yeah, this is number two for the day. <laughs> Might as well run the day just right. Yeah, this is my first cigar in like two weeks, so <clears throat> I'm just happy to be having one at this point. <laughs> I oh, did. you've been sick, so that's not... Yeah. So, it's not good to smoke when you have a respiratory thing going on. This is true. I did oh, order yeah, some Padron 1964 Anniversary Maduro Robustos, a five-pack yeah. of those, uh, because I heard how incredibly good they are, so I'm going to try those. And then I bought... <laughs> And I said in the chat room, Nika Rustica, which I also like, but that's not my favorite one. It's Nika Libre, which is my favorite one. And that's what I ordered the, the 25 cigar sampler of. So. Ah. <clears throat> so I'm using my Vertigo. Woo. My cheapy Vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic V-notch, because that's what I like uh, cutting. I'm still working on getting a V-cutter. <clears throat> I think we'll just do one. It has a nice draw with one. I got my trusty old Coleman lighter. <laughs> Get the nice pre-light going on here. Make sure you got a good burn coverage. Yep, so far this thing is burning perfectly. As it should. This is one of the better cigars out there. I did a okay job burning it. <laughs> Not perfect, but I am using a blowtorch, so you know. <laughs> yeah, your mileage not, may vary. Not quite as accurate. The uh, the good old Moretti is still not uh, 
Still not wanting to light in this nice cold weather. So I have a Guinness draft. And <clears throat> so I forgot to cut our uh, bottle opener. So I'm going to try it with this pair of pliers. <laughs> so this could be bad. <laughs> uh, you should just use the edge of your counter. I don't have a stable countertop, or I would. Uh, uh, just use your laptop. Yeah, yeah. Let's... <laughs> Good. <laughs> hey, look at that. No disaster or anything. And the, the cap is off. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have anything quite as fancy. I, I'm just... <laughs> quite as fancy as a pair of pliers? <laughs> <That's> zero. <laughs> 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 I had my drinking yesterday when I went skiing, so I, uh, I uh, try not to partake on too many days in a row. <laughs> Trying to, you know, be all 2018 diety. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your 30-second video of you going down the hill. <clears throat> Michaela Schiffrin, you ain't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am not an expert. That's sure. <laughs> but it was, it was pretty fun. We had a lot of fun uh, kind of carving in and out of the trees and the upper mountain and then uh, just kind of blasting through the uh, uh, through the kind of nasty moguls uh, down the lower side. Did about, um, I think uh, my, my tracker didn't work at all. My friend's tracker, he started a little bit late, but I think he got like about 15,000 feet vertical. And I think we only skied for about, started skiing about 10 and we stopped about 1.30. So about three and a half hours, four hours of skiing. So not bad. A lot of a lot of mileage. That's a good day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, our mountain has uh, really slow lifts on the front, but if you go around the back where it's not so groomed and nice, um, they have a quad back there that's like super fast. So you know, ski down to the bottom, get on it, and you're like up there within a couple minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're back to another, you know, two miles down or a mile and a half down or something like that. So super fast. And the, uh, if you go out front, it's like about 20 minute <laughs> on the left. <laughs> so we spent most of our time in the back. We just, you know, get the, get the, get the vertical feet in and then, uh, then go have lunch and, and drinks. I always love the backside of a mountain because you're away from, yeah you know, whatever village is nearby and it's just quiet and open and country. And it's usually very beautiful on the backside of the mountain. Oh yeah. Well, this is a uh, no exception, uh, except for the today it was, uh, or yesterday it was just full of snow. <laughs> so it was snowing the entire time while we were there. So, uh, you know, complete, complete, not a complete whiteout, but you know, nearly a complete whiteout most of the time. Um, we had good visibility skiing, but, uh, you, you didn't see the sky or anything else like that. That's kind of, I like that though. I, I love that snowing when it's skiing uh, or when you're skiing is great. Yeah, yeah. So it did make for good conditions. Uh, the groomers were a little bit fluffy, so uh, they were nice to kind of tear down real quick. And then uh, the uh, <coughs> the uh, oh, the moguls were, of course, nice and puffy. And there were some hard spots. And uh, we did a I think we did a black diamond, uh, more sculpted <laughs> stuff. Right. And uh, some of those moguls are, are, are pretty iced underneath, so they were really hard. <laughs> so if you kind of missed your turn and came on top of them, you kind of get you know a little jump in, in place. <laughs> well, I got <clears throat> I got a uh, box today from the Ukraine. Cool. Which had my QSL cards in it, which I'll get to in a second. But <laughs> I thought this was interesting. <clears throat> the postage. <clears throat> So here's uh, the top. <laughs> wow, that's and a lot of stamps. Uh, <laughs> and the bottom. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> so apparently, this is this is how you mail stuff in the Ukraine. So uh, that's outrageous. <laughs> but I did get the cards. So here's uh, here's the back of it. You've seen this before. This is pretty standard, you know. Oh, yeah. But, got your Ole Miss number on there. Yep. Got the Ole Miss. Got the 3905 and all that. And that is what the front of it looks like. So Nice. Nice and clean. little lightning. Yep. 
Sh- shouldn't we be like tornadoes since you're in Missouri? <laughs> well, this is obviously not location specific. I just really like the image. So. Yeah. yeah. I doctored it a bit, but it's pretty cool. It looks like Tampa Bay or something. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Or just could be out over the Atlantic or something. Who knows? But in the, I don't know if it comes across on the camera, but it's got a really nice, I, like I said, I photoshopped it a bit. It's got like in the highlights, um, like over here, it's got a really brilliant like purple color. It's, it looks oh, yeah. really cool in, uh, when you see it for real. So if you get one, you'll get to see one. <laughs> yeah, so make sure you uh, send him a card. <laughs> yeah, actual QSO works too. I do yeah. do send them out for that. Yeah, cool. I still love the box though. That's hilarious. I've never seen that much postage before. <laughs> yeah, I don't they know. Obviously, don't have like electronic postage over there. I guess not. Or he was trying to get rid of you know last year's stamps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me put like ten books of stamps on this and uh, send it to the U.S. of A. See, the thing is, on, like on these right here, each one of these is $5 or 5 whatever the you know the currency is for the Ukraine. So they must not be worth very much because there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either that or that box costs $250 to ship, which I don't think is... <laughs> I'm, I'm looking up Ukraine postage right now because that is just so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them have an X, and some of them say 5.00 of whatever the uh, the units are for the Ukraine. I don't know if they're rubles or, or something else. Yeah, let's see here. Who knows? Huh. Oh, here we go. I almost had it there. <laughs> Someone has a foreign rate service here for, let's say, Ukraine. Ukraine, not the UK. Almost, right? That's pretty close. Here, I'm going to pull it up on my screen. Ukraine currency. They're called Hrvnias. Ukrainian Hrvnias. Hmm. Hrivnias or something like that. Yeah. H-Y-R or H-R-Y Vinia. <laughs> yeah. So let me see. There must be... Let me count these up here. I don't know what the X is. I don't know what the X value is. That must be like a forever stamp. <clears throat> yeah, possibly. But there's eight... It says like one of their stamps is like 70 cents. 1, 2, 3, something 4, like 5, that. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 there... And there's 14 there, so that's 31. And then on this side, we have 18, 22, 4. So 31 and 24 is 55. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, Seventy-nine, eighty, one, eighty-two, three, forty-five, six, eighty-seven, eighty-eight. Okay, and then all the rest of these are value V. So there's eighty-eight of the fives and X's, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty-three of the V's. So whatever that all adds up to. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> seems like a lot. Did you pay like like a thousand dollars for this, these QSL cards? That's the thing. That seems like there's almost as much shipping cost as what I paid for the QSL cards. Because I want to say I paid seventy seven dollars for a thousand cards. Wow! And that included the shipping. So. That doesn't seem like nearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe somebody I'll, can comment below in the video and tell us how much <laughs> how much postage that actually is in U.S. dollars. I might do that. I might post it in the in the bucket on the video, so you can figure out how much you spent in shipping. <laughs> That's uh, a lot. Yeah, 
least it seems like a lot. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe they're only like a nickel a piece or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't you say a normal stamp cost uh, seventy cents roughly? I mean, that's what it says here on this guy's site for doing like QSL cards and stuff like that, sending the QSL cards back and forth. But you're sending a box, so it's different. Yeah, let's see a V stamp. I'm looking this up with the browser window open. So let's see. I'm looking at Ukrainian postage here. <laughs> wow. It's a Wikipedia article. And this, this doesn't even have the stamps that are on here that I have. <laughs> so, oh well. Okay, that's enough about Ukrainian stamps. <laughs> <laughs> Still interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody can fill us in that's from the Ukraine or something like that that knows. <laughs> I don't know if we have any listeners in the Ukraine. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, yeah. So what else you got going on? Um... Did this already this already tapped off? Huh. Disappointing. Still burning great, but already dropped ash. <laughs> yeah, not quite as a oily. Mine's still hanging in there. Not a perfect burn, but still uh, acceptable. Yeah, this is this is really good on the burn. And I have checked my both of my humidors, and in the one in the plastic one, I'm using those um, tubes, the cigar tubes, for humidification. I have five in there roughly for a hundred cigars, give or take. And it's mm -hmm. keeping it an absolutely perfect 72. And then I finally got a, a <clears throat> hygrometer for my other one, the one that I could never get the, the reading right on. And right now it's sitting at about 75%. So also very good. Cool. Well, that's a good sign. Yep. It's got everything kind of back to normal. Exactly. And I have those I got from my friend, those ones that were produced in 1998, the Dos Lomas. And those yeah. have been in there now for about a month. So I'm going to give them about another month, and I'm going to light one up Try right one. here and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> make, sure you're, make sure you're wearing flame retardant clothing just in <laughs> <Right>. case. <laughs> and I'll have a fire extinguisher handy just in case. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You never know. Like... Uh... It being out of humidification that long, how, how damaged it could possibly be. Right. So I've been looking at Ansible, and I've been invited to be on the Admin Admin podcast. So cool. I'm going to be doing that on, well, we're recording it on Sunday, and then I have no idea when it will be released. But, uh, and I'm not really sure what we're going to be talking about. But. Sweet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I listened to that one. I'd have to check my other feed. Well, I know I, I don't. Podcast on my other computer. I know John Spriggs, G7VRI, has been taking over for one of the hosts that's on hiatus over there. So he's the yeah. one who invited me on. So. <clears throat> cool. Well, that's a, that's a good tie in there to one of our listeners. Yeah, and I hope it comes out well. I mean, it's it'll be interesting to see how it goes because there it's about systems administration, which is my job, and they're all in the UK except for me. So it'll be interesting for me to see how systems administration is on the other side of the pond, as it were, oh, yeah. and probably interesting to for them to see how it is on this side. Oh, well, we always just use AWS over here and, like, bang our heads against walls and stuff. <laughs> you don't cloud host anything. I'm, I'm too paranoid for that. All of, all of our stuff's in-house. Yeah, I, I have a, a, a lot of agreement with that for very normal cases. <laughs> it's nice to be able to use, like, DigitalOcean or AWS or even Azure to spin something up just for a quick test or whatever. But anything production stays in-house, at least for me. Yeah, I mean, our, our app has to be available all over the place, so it's uh, it's not going to a single vendor or a single person. So right, it makes sense to have it on the cloud so it's more available to other people. It just makes it some more, sort of a, more of a pain in the butt to, from the management side of things. You know, I like, I like the way... Uh, 
server software operates on bare metal better than virtual metal. So <clears throat> yeah, as do I. But the biggest thing for me is just the security part of it. I don't. I mean, I'm sure AWS is is well vetted, but I still like to keep my stuff where I can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's locked down and stuff like that, so you can't get to can't you can lock off uh, services to you know specific IPs. You can have it. You know, managing that kind of stuff is pretty nice because you can you know manage your privacy keys and stuff like that if you want to use keys or if you want to use um, you know. Uh, IP um, management and stuff like that, you can do that, and they have uh, pretty easy ways to manipulate that from uh, from their GUI on the website. But you know that is still, you know, if you can get to the website on the AWS console, which everybody can, <laughs> you can affect everybody's stuff if you have the right username password combination. Right. So I mean, there are still, you know, a few weak points here and there and stuff like that. So. Uh, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. do like DigitalOcean. I, I do like. I do yeah. like that. I, I'm using that for uh, for the Mumble server and for uh, the Echo Link box. Yeah, and that I'm, seems that seems pretty nice. I I do, I do like that quite a lot. I'm building a Zimbra server on a droplet right now because I'm having some issues with mine. We're getting a lot of notifications from like credit card companies that say they can't email us for like our monthly automatic drafts and stuff and I can't figure out why so I was going to build a Zimbra server on a droplet and then move a couple of accounts over to that just to see if that fixes the problem <clears throat> and their new pricing tiers are nice they've actually made the droplets less expensive so that's oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I gave them more memory and uh, less expensive and a little bit more transfer and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much what kind of prompted me to switch over. I was running the uh, Echo Link server on uh, on AWS for uh, for Jambo, and then uh, when I saw the price drop, I was like, "Well, I'm, I'm paying too much anyway, and I should have moved it a long time ago." So <laughs> I was like, ah, "Screw it! I'll just go and put it over there." Right. It's not a you know the bridge itself, the the software for running Echolink node on on Linux is not that great. So I do have to run a script behind it. So when it crashes, which it will crash, <laughs> it restarts the service. Um, I don't know why it has that behavior when the Windows client doesn't. I just I can't imagine. There's not a much code code difference between the two because they're both compiled out of the same code. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. The code base is old, though. I mean, we're talking the 1.09 is from, you know, six, seven, eight years ago or something like that. So it's not like a lot of improvements have been made along the way. Right. I'm kind of hoping UPS shows up here in the next few minutes so I can uh, show off the new microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll they'll probably yes. wait until like eight o'clock tonight or something. Yeah, if only UPS could deliver you better internet service out there. <laughs> yeah, if only, if only. Well, <laughs> CenturyLink says they're going to give us fiber, you know, in the not too distant future, but who knows when that will be. So, yeah, there's a there's a new fiber ped a third of a mile down the road here, so <clears throat> I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> it's only a matter of time, right? Do you have like what do you have now? Just DSL? Yeah, really crappy DSL. Ten meg, ten meg down, seven sixty eight k up. Oh wow, yeah. They don't have a way to give you like bonded uh, DSL, or you get two basically two DSL lines that are bonded together. They could probably do VDSL, but they won't. <laughs> oh okay. Because <laughs> they're dicks. <laughs> Basically, yeah, because we have we had CenturyLink here too, and they uh, they did an upgrade in the neighborhood. Then they came around and was asking, uh, "Hey, you know, you want to switch your internet provider?" And they were, you know, peddling their wares. And I'm like, "Well, you know, I, I do a lot of pushing data out, so I need upstream, and your upstream just really isn't that great." Right. <laughs> and uh, they're like, "Well, we could sell you this bonded pair, and it's like I don't know, ten bucks more or something like that." And I'm like, "Yeah." I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll think about it. 
I don't like the cable company's solution here either. I mean, they they, they really poorly manage the uh, RF network here. Yeah. It's quite obvious with the performance I see on a daily basis. There's no consistency. Um, they're probably oversubscribed in their nodes. They don't have them broken up, broken up enough. Because uh, the town is growing. I mean, Billings is growing pretty quick. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be on top of that stuff. And I, I just – I don't feel – as if they're managing it properly. Coming from my RF background, when when uh, cable modems were first coming out, and we spent a lot of time, you know, breaking up the nodes and and you know dividing them up so we could get as much bandwidth as possible to the customers, and we were constantly watching, you know, those downstreams and upstreams to make sure they weren't getting saturated or even near saturation. Right. I don't have a lot of experience with the cable side of things because <clears throat> I've only lived in a couple of places where cable was an option. <laughs> so, uh, pretty much been having DSL my whole life. Well, after modems, after, you know, analog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had cable modems for, well, years. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had fiber when I was in Tampa. That was the nicest, uh, nicest setup. We had a fiber to the house, so yep. uh, the connectivity there was amazing. Um, but uh, haven't been that lucky here. Uh, cable is the option. Let's see, I think I think the UPS man is here. Maybe he has your microphone for me. <laughs> One second. All right, ask him. Yeah. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about Ansible on the last episode, 207 of the podcast. And it looks like an interesting solution. And I've been talking to some other folks about setting it up and using like a dedicated sudo user <clears throat> for doing the administration part of Ansible. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> with like key encryption for the SSH to kind of keep it nice and secure. Sounds like hey, he didn't be, have your microphone, by the way. He didn't have my microphone? Oh, crap. Well, hopefully that means that my guy has it, which is, would be better. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're talking about Ansible again? Yeah, I just filled a few seconds while you were dealing with UPS <clears throat> about Ansible. Yeah, it was actually FedEx Ground. They were dropping off... Uh, Something stupid. I don't even know. Something my wife ordered, probably. <laughs> yeah, but it's not for you. Nothing it's, for it's me. It's dumb. Yeah. Yeah, nothing for me. I didn't. <clears throat> I was I was gonna fix my uh, do some antenna work, but I realized that my coax is buried under all the ice and snow, so I can't move my coax or do anything to it until after my yard melts. <laughs> I'm still trying so. to figure out how to get the legs of my my horizontal antenna like up where they're supposed to be. It's a Alpha Delta DXCC. And so the legs of it are, I don't know, good 42 feet per side. Some, somewhere in there. Yeah. And uh, because of, because of the trapping and the, the way it's set up, so my house is only 72 feet long and uh, so it sticks basically 10 feet off each end. <laughs> so haven't, haven't figured out a decent way to get those ends up. I'm thinking the best way to do it might be to buy a vertical. <laughs> <laughs> well, that generally gets the end up. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes with the uh, territory. I mean... Yeah, I mean, if you don't have a tower or something like that, you can bring the center up or something like that. You know, your other option is to have them, you know, have somebody come in and put a telephone pole up with a pulley on the top for you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to keep it to a reasonable cost, too. I have no idea how much it is to set a telephone pole. I'm assuming they don't It's do a lot it. cheaper than a tower. <laughs> Well, Depending on how high you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the ta I'm, I'm on basically just a mast right now, and yeah. a tower, I'd probably have to have probably 50 feet of tower, 
And I don't know what 50 feet of Rowan goes for these days, but I know it's not cheap. Nah. Nah. Plus, you got to get all the guy and everything else. You know, even if you, well, if you got like a stand, freestanding one or something like that, those are much more expensive. They're, you're not talking Rowan 25 then because those won't freestand. I don't think I don't think they recommend freestanding them above like 40 feet. Yeah, well, I could probably get away with 40 feet and have enough room to bring, to slope it down and, and reach the ends of the house. But still requires buying 40 feet of tower. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should be able to find some used tower. I mean, I know when I was collecting tower bits with my friend in Florida, uh, we ended up with like about 200 foot of Roan 25 and about 100 foot of Roan 45 just by going around and taking people's towers down that they didn't want anymore. <laughs> we were just like making our weekend projects. We'd, uh, you know, look in the... Uh, Look in the classifieds or uh, where they call the club and say, hey, my husband died. Can you get all this crap out of here? <laughs> <laughs> I see so, yeah. tower for sale all the time from, from the club that I'm still a part of, but all the towers in Maine. And uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a transportation issue there. A bit of one, yeah. But I don't know. Cheryl and I are actually planning on driving to my parents' house at the end of this month. Oh, wow. So, well, if we do that, maybe I might try and find some Rowan Tower and just strap it to the roof on the way back. And uh, Yeah, that would be safe. <laughs> <laughs> didn't say anything about safety. I just, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> but I couldn't, I mean, I've got a trailer I could put it in, but, you know, hauling a trailer 3,000 miles is very cost prohibitive when it comes to the gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. The wind loading, too, putting uh, four sections of Rome 25 on your roof would be pretty bad, too. <laughs> well, I wouldn't stand them vertically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you lay it down, it's still... I had, a, I had a roof rack that was, like, one of these ones that are, like, metal fiber or whatever, metal channels and stuff like that, so you can put crap in on your roof. And Man, I couldn't believe how much wind resistance that thing had when you put it up on the roof. I was like, ugh. Oh. These vehicles really aren't designed for stuff hanging up on the top. I would have thought the Roan Tower laying down wouldn't create such a wind load. I mean, it's mostly air. <laughs> you would think. There's a lot of surface area for it to hit, though. Yeah, I suppose. Because you got to realize the wind is kind of vortexing around the vehicle and stuff like that. So those are creating little mini vortices going the other direction, possibly, and all different. So, yeah, yeah it would be a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. I hope that comes to pass, though. We're trying to find a place to stay up there, and then <clears throat> planning on doing it like three days out and three days back, and hitting Niagara Falls on the way out, and a couple of stops on the way back. So Go through Canada or something like that? Well, we don't have to go through Canada. We would, we would go up along the Canadian border up into like Rochester, and then towards Niagara Falls, Ontario, and actually stay in Ontario for the evening. For the night, yeah, and then go back into the states to <clears throat> make it all the way over to New Hampshire. But <clears throat> trying to break it up into roughly 500 mile a day uh, segments because <laughs> it's yeah basically exactly 1500 miles from here to there. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a pretty long drive. It's going to be kind of like my drive to Dayton. <laughs> I think your drive to Dayton is even longer than that. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's close to like sixteen hundred, but I think it's in the fifteen hundred range. Well, now that's in Xenia, right? Let's see, five to Xenia, Ohio. Let's see. It says it is fifteen hundred and sixty-six miles. It's hard to believe. It's as far. From where you are to Xenia, Ohio, as it is from where I am to the East Coast. <laughs> well, you're, you'd be like at the halfway mark for me. <laughs> well, halfway through my journey, I'd be in like Minneapolis, which is like, you know, just north of you. <laughs> well, just north is, relatively well, speaking, because I think it's about 10 hours north. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying relatively, you know, east to west. <laughs> Oh, you're probably more closer to the Dells, I think, or something like that, maybe. <laughs> no, when, when you're talking about coming across I-90, we're not close to anything. 
Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, for you guys. Yeah, if I came down to 70, then that'd be different, right? Then I'd cut right past you guys. Um, yeah, we're three but, hours, well, two and a half hours south of I-70. So. Yeah, that would take me, that would be like 20, 2,000 miles or something like that if I went that direction. <laughs> now, mine would probably take me the same way I went last time, is through North Dakota. And it wouldn't be worth come. it because we'd actually be in Ohio already. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll either do that or come through South Dakota and then meander my way through Iowa on over. Uh, I haven't decided yet. So you're going to you're gonna come to Indianapolis, though, right? Oh, yeah, either way I go through Indy. Either way you go through Indy, okay, yeah. Yeah, because once you hit Chicago, you have to come down to... 70. Yeah. Or whatever that is. Yeah, that's 70, isn't it? Well, you'd, you'd probably take 57 out of Chicago down to 70. 65. Yeah, 65 down to Indy. Oh, you do have to... 57 takes you over Champaign, so that's actually moves you further west. Okay, all right. So, yeah, I'd come wrap around Chicago, almost over to uh, South Holland, and then hang south on 65. Although, like, last time I got kind of screwed up and lost there coming through Chicago. I thought I was taking a shortcut and ended up not taking a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I think I ended up. I, I think I ended up doing fifty-seven and realizing I was getting further away from my destination. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if you're in Chicago, doesn't fifty-seven go slightly southeast? Uh, southwest. It is southwest. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now that I think about it, yeah. Cause yeah I think. I I think I could avoid Chicago completely if I just took 39 south into Bloomington and then came across, which is an option. If you're in Bloomington, that's what, 72 or 74 or something? 74, yeah. 74, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because 39 is direct north-south. That doesn't look too bad. But yeah, I don't know. I don't have to think about that yet. That's in May. That's true. <laughs> Maybe I'll get enough airline miles if my wife keeps on uh, hitting my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Still trying to figure out if it's worth staying at the AC. I love that hotel. But it is a little you know, further away than a couple of the other ones and more expensive. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. And all the food around there was a little bit on the spendier side, too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we did, did splurge a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. But that Italian place was really good. Oh, yeah. Brio, that wasn't bad. Yeah. 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 And the other place, the, the pub and pub and pie. or Pie, pie and pub or pie, pub and yeah. pie. Or, yeah, that place wasn't bad. The pizza place. Yeah. I and love their. There, there was uh, the place we met. Uh, what's his name? Yeah, where was that? Where we met uh, Scott? Nah, I can't remember. Yeah, it was in the same place, though. It was like yeah, it's all about the same little, mall or whatever. Little American fast food pub thingy, Merbobber. <laughs> they didn't have really good seating there for Cheryl either. That was kind of screwed up. They kind of put us at a weird table. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, closer, closer is better because then we don't have to get up as early. Yeah, I just wanted some place with a pool and an indoor pool. Yeah. And some place where we could, you know, go out and have a smoke. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Where For you're sure. not, like, under the awning of the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm sorry, sir, you need to move back 50 feet away from the doors. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to be, you know, maybe like a courtyard hotel or something like that where there's a, like a garden or some, some sort of area like that. Always nice. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll see. I am uh, probably not going to make it to Linux Fest Northwest. The more and more I look at it, it's just not going to be compatible with my work calendar. Uh. So I'll probably probably cancel those reservations i kind of want to go but i don't know i don't know if it'd be enough value for me to go how far is bellingham from there uh it's like 10 hours that's not too bad 
No, it's a it's a day's drive, you know. You can just drive it in Bellingham. Let's see, Bellingham, Washington is eight hundred ninety nine miles. Eight hundred ninety nine. So that's a little bit more than ten hours. That's fourteen hours. Yeah, so. that's a pretty good I drive. Forgot. Yeah, that's. That's yeah, how, I don't know. That's how far it is for us to get to uh, Southeast Linux Fest in North Carolina. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, God, you know, flights weren't so darn expensive out of Billings. It would be a lot easier, but <laughs> just kind of in the middle of nowhere out here in Montana. Just They take advantage of you at the airports here. There's not many flights that are under like $600 a ticket, so... And coming from Tampa, Florida, where I used to live, uh, you know, you could fly. I could fly out to Seattle for two hundred bucks. <laughs> well, I got I got tickets to go see my parents from Kansas City to Boston for one eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. I wish we don't have anything like that. <laughs> but Kansas City Airport's three hours away. So. Yeah, I think we could, I think I could fly to Seattle cheap from here with. Um, we have Alaska Airlines. They fly in and out of there to here and over to PDX as well to Portland. To Oregon, yeah. Uh, those aren't I, – I hear those aren't too bad price-wise if you're just doing, you know, out and back. Um, but, like, to go with Delta or United out of here – I guess we have uh, American Airlines too. They fly through uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Okay, uh, yeah. I haven't, haven't priced them yet, but I don't know if I want to – Fly all the way south to fly all the way north. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of flight time. <laughs> One thing that's it's better about, than driving, I guess, at some point. But all the airlines have to go through their hubs basically anymore. So, you know, for us, if we wanted to use like Delta, for example, we'd have to fly through Atlanta to go anywhere, even if it's on the West Coast. <laughs> or you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, here for Delta, we fly to Minneapolis or Salt Lake City, and then you go from there. Um, occasionally they do run flights to uh, Chicago, direct to O'Hara. Do you not have like Frontier? Because they would fly through Denver. No, we have United, which is, you know, Frontier, more Frontier expensive. <laughs> 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 they fly to Denver, yeah. So they'll, they're, they're, they're our Denver hookup is to take United. I could fly out of Bozeman and they actually have Frontier there. So I could cut some costs, but I have to drive, you know, two hours over there to, jump a flight when the airport here is just less than five minutes away. <laughs> right. It would be so nice if we had an airport that was closed. We do have, I mean, Springfield's only 30 minutes away, but the only thing they fly out of there are regional jets, and I can't squeeze my ass into a regional jet seat. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be a full-size Boeing, all right? <laughs> Got to be a, a real plane, yeah, like an yes. MD-80 or... The 737 or something like that. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, no ki no kitty planes. No kitty planes, that's right. No wind-up toys. Got to have a real airplane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because they don't fly that many flights in and out of here, so generally they do fly the bigger planes into Billings, so, like, it'll be a 737 or it'll be a scare bus, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so generally you get the big plane. Once in a while it'll be just a small little hopper. Yeah, this one's doing much better now. There we go. Oh, yeah, that's hanging in there. <laughs> That's it. I knocked mine off accidentally. I hit it on the desk, and <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's still still doing good. Kind of the burn kind of cleaned up a little bit too. So yeah, this is burning up like absolutely razor sharp. So perfect, and the it's just getting better. The flavors just get better as these go along. That's why I love them. So they start off yeah, a little this is bit very mild. This one's very very mild. Yeah, these are medium. Medium to full, they've got a good flavor to them, a little bit of pepper. They start off basically just sort of dry earth and tobacco, but then they move into nicer, more complex flavors so the more you get into it. So they're yeah. very good cigars. I think they're like 95 or 97 rated or something when they first came out. Yeah, I was just looking this one up. This has a Criollo wrapper and an Ecuador Habano wrapper. And oh, it's a Dominican too. Oh, well, it no Dominican, my Dominican no. rule. You hate Dominican. The filler, yeah. The binder is Nicaraguan. Filler is Dominican Nicaraguan. And 
I don't know what they rate this one on. It's got good ratings on Cigars International. Let's see what the. <clears throat> it's got good ratings. It's pretty much on all the websites I can see. I was trying to find their official, like, cigar aficionado rating. Yeah. This is the Oliva Siri V Melania Gran Reserva L- Limitada. So, yeah. If you, want a, if you want a good cigar, definitely you can't go wrong with these. They're super highly rated. Yeah. They're excellent. <clears throat> and they're not ridiculously expensive. They're not cheap, but they're not <laughs> they're not stupid expensive either. So <laughs> they're yeah, not, what are these things? I mean I got these on special, so these run for a box of fifteen, 119 bucks. So these are almost a ten dollar cigar. Well, no, that's not right. Fifteen well no, a little less. Pack of five is forty two. So what's that about eight bucks? All right, I'll just look these up real quick since I have a browser window. And yeah, so these are on the pricier side, but uh, like I say, I got them in a in a pack deal, so I didn't feel like I was paying too much for it. There, um, these are what I have here: the Oliva Siri V Milano, and I have the Robusto, which is this, the five by fifty-two, and a box of ten is eighty-five ninety-nine. So eight dollars and sixty cents a piece. That is on sale. Regular price is one hundred two twenty four. So, so a ten dollars cigar. Yep. But again, that's you know, for a good cigar, that's not out of bounds. <laughs> no, no, no. But there's there's plenty that are cheaper than that that are good too. So yeah, absolutely. I try and keep them five dollars and under when I buy cigars. That's my that's my <laughs> price point five dollars and under. That's why you look for sales. Yeah. <laughs> you go ahead and sign up for all those stupid emails, so occasionally you find the really good sale. <laughs> but if you if you were to buy this at a local tobacconist, you'd probably pay sixteen or eighteen dollars a stick for it. So, oh yeah, yeah. You get yeah. raped on the individual sales of singles and stuff like that. That's pretty uh pretty typical. Yeah. I mean if you if you know what you're getting, then it's fine to buy a box. Um if you don't know what you're getting, <laughs> it Beware. might be hard to swallow the pill of buying a box. Yeah, but you'll definitely get the savings from it. Um, I suggest uh, if you're if you're new to cigar smoking, do uh, get the grab bag deals and stuff like that. Uh, I've had pretty good luck uh, finding cigars that I normally wouldn't smoke by picking up, uh, you know, blind grab bags of you know singles. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, tobacconist will start clearing out their there are single racks and stuff like that, and they'll bundle them up and sell them at a pretty uh, substantially reduced rate. And I know uh, Tampa Humidor used to do this all the time, and they do like two or three times a year. They would uh, clean all the singles out and uh, do these mystery grab bags. Uh, you know, you get like 16 cigars for 40 bucks or something like that, and uh, they were always always good, always good, always always found some keepers in there. Good deal. Yeah, it's. I mean, if you can find bundles, especially like uh, bandless ones or something, they're usually good premium cigars, long filler cigars. They just debadge them so you don't know what you're getting. But you can usually find a decent, you know, array of things in there. Find something you like, and they're usually run one fifty to three dollars, maybe a cigars. <clears throat> yeah, just check CI and Tampa Humidor and Pipes and Cigars and. All the other places that are out there, and just look for their their brown bag specials. They like, they've all got them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like the, these these I got from that Corona Cigar Company. It's the first time I ordered from them, but uh, they were pretty quick. I got it shipped right away, and uh, actually showed up here in three days with U.S. Postal Service. So <laughs> from yeah, Florida, right. so not bad at all. Well, that's probably good enough for an episode. I think we rambled at least an hour. <laughs> so I guess we'll call this LHS Shop Talk number three, train wreck number three, something like that. Train wreck, <laughs> yep, yeah. See if I bang into my microphone stuff here some more. <laughs> and my, we'll my do it. Uh, swing arm and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> right. We'll do another one sometime, but we'll catch you the next time, I guess.
And then we'll, yeah, we'll like you're... smile for the fade out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> 73. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>